Mike was most certainly money as Michael Harris II went from double A to winning NL Rookie of the Year for the Braves in 2022. And along the way, getting a contract that could keep him patrolling center field through 2032. Welcome into BPTV, Corey McCartney and Grant McCauley with you as always. And Grant, maybe best illustrating the impact that Harris made in his debut season was this 21-year-old getting some down ballot MVP votes. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to really overstate what Michael Harris meant to the Braves. It coincided with this club really taking off, figuring out a way to make up a 10-and-a-half game deficit in the National League East and win the division for the fifth straight time. And when you go back and look at late May, what things were going on that really turned the Braves' season around? Yeah, it took all 26 men at a time to really turn this into another NL East championship, but you got Michael Harris in center field. You got Spencer Strider into your rotation. I don't think it's any coincidence these guys were one and two in NL Rookie of the Year. And even if you flip that ballot, you wouldn't be surprised at all about that because these two guys were impact players. And I don't know if you make a bigger single impact than the rise from double A to center field to gold glove candidate and rookie of the year like Michael Harris was last year. Well, as we dive into what went right, what went wrong, and what's next for Harris, certainly a lot went right during a 4-8 F4 season that tied yeah. him with Dusty Baker in 1972 for the second highest of any Braves position player uh, in franchise history among rookies. And Harris hit 297 with an 853 OPS, 19 homers, 20 stolen bases, had eight defensive runs saved, seven outs above average. It was almost laughable that he was not a gold glove finalist in center field. But as you mentioned, his May 28th arrival allowed the Braves to go from 18th in center field production. That's 5% below league average to tie for fourth at 117 WRC plus the rest of the way. And they went from a 468 winning percentage that was eighth in the NL to an MLB best 687 clip after this call up. A lot of other things went into this, as you mentioned, yep. Spencer Strider moving in. But, I mean, just what he brought in terms of stability in the center field position and what he meant to that lineup, I mean, this was a major factor in a fifth straight division crown. Yeah, and you just had a feeling like this was a special prospect, a, a special player to come for the Braves at some point in the future, but you just didn't know the future was going to be now in the case of 2022. He started his season in double A, hit extremely well. And the Braves, I feel like they just had to know that they had the confidence already in the player that Michael Harris had shown and that it could be going all the way back, I think, to 2020. They knew that the makeup was there. And even though the kid is young in terms of his actual age, heading into his age 22 season this year, they knew that he had the aptitude and the ability to be able to make this jump. Otherwise, I don't think they would have even entertained this as an option because while it does happen more and more in baseball in recent years, making that jump from double A at 21 years old, becoming the youngest player in the major leagues for at least a period of time, that's something that uh, is, is a very heavy onus to put on a player. And Michael Harris, I mean, he passed every test with flying colors. And if you told me before the year that not only is Michael Harris going to come up and debut, not only is he going to play a gold glove caliber center field, not only is he going to win the rookie of the year award, but his final wins above replacement is going to be above Ronald Acuna Jr. I would have said, what kind of year is he having? And maybe <laughs> what kind of a year is Ronald having? But as it turned out, there were some challenges for the guy in right field, but the guy in center field, man, did he make this club better in just about every facet of the game, whether it's in the field, at the plate, on the bases, he showed off all of his skills to win that rookie of the year award. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously a fantastic athlete. As Vaughn Harris told us during Braves Fest, anything that you have this guy try, he's going to be good at. He said yeah. just, you know, they talked about how do you do a backflip, and all of a sudden he's doing them into the pool. I mean, he, he bowls, he plays golf, and just all of it, he finds a way to be good at it. But certainly I think yeah, this gets thrown out a lot, the cliche, but I think he really is an old soul, right? It just feels yeah. like no nothing uh, ra you know phases him whatsoever. And there's not a lot to nitpick as we look at what went wrong, but I will say he did hit 20% below league average against left lefties compared to 61% above against righties. He also had some issues with plate discipline. He had a chase rate of 39%, which was nearly 11% uh, over league average. It was in the bottom 7% of players overall there. That's why the walk rate was under 5%, much lower than he had in any of his minor league stops. He was also 29th percentile in K rate at 24.3, striking out 100 times for the first time as a professional. But Grant, those are really all growth potential spots for him. And, and I think it really offers you the opportunity to think, man, the ceiling, we don't even know what it is yet for this kid. Yeah. And as the youngest player in the national league, and again, one of the youngest players in baseball last year, you know, there are going to be some growing pains. I mean, even the, the biggest phenoms, even Mike Trout, when he came up, I mean, he struggled in his first taste of the big leagues. Of course, he turned himself into Mike Trout the very next year. And we all know what kind of player he is. And it's not really fair to compare, you know, every 
talent that comes along to perhaps a generational ball player like a Mike Trout. So let me put that over to the side, but tell you, you know, you knew that there were going to be certain things, whether it was the chase rate, the walk rate being a little bit low, K rate being a little bit higher than he wants. But these are all things I feel like he can and will improve on as he becomes a full on major leaguer for more than just 114 games. So you do feel like that capability is there. And I, I thought it was great what Vaughn Grissom said at FanFest, like you mentioned, just that he sees Michael Harris and having played with him for the last couple of years, he sees Michael accomplish something and Vaughn feels like, hey, I can accomplish that because I can play with this guy. And I think that's kind of like an underrated, maybe low key thing to watch because Vaughn's talented in his own right. Michael Harris obviously had all of the success that you needed to to win an award and to help the Braves do a lot of winning. Von Grissom got that first taste of the majors, and now he is coming into a year in which he can kind of look out in the center field and say, you know what, if that guy can be out here every day, I can be here at shortstop every day. I think that's kind of cool because I know we talk a lot about leadership and how this team connects and all of that, but the way that these pieces fit from the 21, 22-year-old all the way up to the you know the oldest veterans on the rosters, the Charlie Mortons of the world, this is a team that has a lot of synergy, and I think that's something to keep an eye on as we head into 2023. Well, we know the Braves no longer have any questions about center field for years to come. And I think there's a real case to be made that this is the healthiest that they've been at the position since the days of Andrew Jones. Steamer yeah. projecting a, a Harris for a four war uh, season again, 4.3 to be exact, a 2020 season, which would be the first for a primary Brave center fielder since Andrew Jones did it in 2000. It's cliche, but I, I think getting there figures to be a byproduct of how he adjusts to the adjustments that are made for him because you know that they're going to come after that spectacular rookie year. Yeah, you know that they are. And whether or not he flirts with a 300 average or an 850 OPS again in his second year, I just feel like he's going to do enough and fill up enough different columns with what his skills allow him to do, what his talent is going to allow him to do, whether that's hitting the 20 homers, stealing the 20 bases. I mean, one thing I was surprised about is he didn't have a ton of outfield assists, but if anybody got a good look at what he did in Washington, flat-footed from the left center field gap to throw somebody out 300 feet to the plate at about, what, 95, 96 miles an hour, I wouldn't run on him either. So you look at all the different ways that he affects the game. You have to get excited about what the future of center field is for the Braves and honestly what the present of center field is for the Braves because even, again, if he has some struggles here and there, you just feel like this guy has the work ethic, the determination, and the skill set to be able to work his way through both the lows and get back to the highs. And I feel like there are going to be a lot more of those for Michael Harris over the next decade. Yeah, and he's not lacking motivation, right, too, after being missing out on being a Gold Glove finalist a year ago. You know he's got his sights deadly set on that in year two. Make sure you ride along with us here on BPTV all the way to spring training. So subscribe, turn on notifications, and get those alerts every time that we drop a new episode. Until next time, I'm Corey McCartney. He's Graham McCauley, and we'll see you soon, Braves country.